His only begotten Son to die on the cross because there is only one way for us to be with God. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So indeed, the way of the cross leads home. Amen. So we're so thankful to the Lord for all the blessings that is uh, giving us, that is pouring our way. We thank God for the safe trip of uh, Sister Terry. She's now in Manila, by the grace of God. And then uh, let's continue to pray for Sister Ruth. Uh, she's planning to, by God, Lord willing, to be in the States uh, this uh, month. So let us uh, pray for her, that the Lord will uh, bless the sweet reunion that she will have with uh, her uh, sister in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. And also pray for our brethren that are not here, that, they, that the Lord will continue to bless them and use them wherever they are. And pray for the church that we can continue to be the beacon of light, not only here in Cambodia, but Lord willing, all around the world. Amen? Because you know the good thing about the church is that you may be in one place, but you can be a part of the world commission. We're in... If we cannot go, then we can help those that are in the different fields in the world so that we can be a part of what they are doing by the grace of God. Also, this may be early, but pray for Pastor Jesse Sang because he will be speaking in uh, Africa, I think Zambia, uh, in May 4 to 7 for their second uh, annual uh, truth something uh, truth of uh, bible truth or something like that but their theme is about baptist distinctive with focus on salvation so he will be going there and pray that the lord will uh, use him by the grace of god and also pray for uh pastor stephen crane uh, the pastor of temple baptist church in uh, Go gulfport mississippi he's in the philippines right now in baguio city and preaching for the anniversary of uh a church there and he's been preaching uh, in several places other places that the lord will use him to be a channel of uh, salvation to the people that will hear the message that the the lord will allow him to preach over there in the philippines and continue to pray for each other and even for the world because of the uh, coronavirus outbreak that is happening right now uh, let us uh, just be careful let us uh, be safe and continue to pray for the people of the world, especially those that are in China, that the Lord will spare them so that they will be given a chance to hear the gospel and be given a chance to repent of their sin and receive the Lord Jesus as their Savior. Okay, so shall, we will stand up and we will pray because we have already read our text for today in Acts chapter 2. We will focus on verses 41 and 42 as we go along with our uh, preaching today heavenly father we're so thankful for your goodness your kindness towards us O oh god we thank you for the salvation that you've given us we thank you O oh god for your grace we thank you that you will never leave us nor forsake us O oh god we thank you that you are using us lord for your glory and i pray that we will be worthy lord and that you will continue lord to use us so that people will be blessed by your love I pray, Lord, even today as we study your word, that we, you forgive us of our sins so that we will be worthy of the principles and the truth that we will encounter from thy word. I pray that your people will have an open heart, an open mind, and enthusiasm, O oh God, to listen to your word, to receive your word gladly, and later on to search the scripture, O oh God, if the things that will be said today are so. I pray, Lord, that you will give me wisdom because by myself, I have nothing, but if the Holy Spirit will use me today, then, Lord, I can be a blessing to your people today. May you be glorified in our midst. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Thank you very much. So we are going to study today about uh, the uh, church in Acts chapter 2. And I entitled the message, A Growing Church. A Growing Church. In verses 41 and 42, the Bible says, Then they that gladly receive his word were baptized. Amen? Amen? So I thank God that there are people who receive the word of God with gladness. 
in their hearts. You see, sometimes you see a lot of people, even Christians, sad to say, that are so sad and dull, and it is as if they do not care about the Word of God. Ladies and gentlemen, the Word of God is our daily food. Amen. It is our spiritual food. Without the Word of God, then we are going to be spiritually sick. And we are going to be an easy prey for the enemy. That is the reason why whenever we hear the Word of God, there must be gladness in our hearts that we are going to receive the Word of God and thank God because He's feeding us every day with the manna that comes from heaven. Amen. And then the Bible says, And they that gladly receive His Word were baptized. I thank God for people who will not only receive the Word of God, but at the same time obey the Word of God. Amen. You see, the Word of God will only be important to us if we apply them in our lives. So many people knew so many things about the Bible, but you do not see those things in their lives. James uh, rebuked them and gave us a warning that whenever we hear the Word of God, it is like a mirror wherein we can behold ourselves and we will see all the infirmities, all the uh, blemishes, all the uh, wrinkles, all the uh, sins that we are committing. And then James says that if you will look, behold, and forget, then you are not wise. But if you will look, you will behold, and then you will do something about it. Then James says that we are a wise hearer of the word of God. Amen. So that is the purpose of hearing. So that we can apply them in our lives. And the Bible says, And the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls. So we can see the exponential growth of this church because they preached the word of God. And then those who got saved, those who were baptized, and the disciples that were present, the Bible says in verse 42, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. So salvation is just the beginning of our race. Amen. It is the beginning of our real life. The Bible says, when you got saved, you are born again, so now you can live spiritually by the grace of God. Real living starts when we live for the Lord. When we only live for ourselves, then we are not actually living, but we are dying, but we are waiting for the day that we will die, and we are going to experience the punishment of the Lord. But when the Lord found us, when we uh, hear the word of God, and when we repented of our sins and open our hearts to receive Jesus as our Savior, then that begins our life. Amen. So this is the first church in the Bible from its inception during the earthly days of the Lord Jesus Christ until the day of Pentecost. So we can see here some characteristics of a growing church. When I say growing, I'm not just talking about numbers. Because today in our time, growth is about numbers, it is about finances, it is about beautiful buildings, it is about property of the church, it is about things that can be seen. But ladies and gentlemen, real growth is spiritual in nature. Real growth is quality and not just quantity. It means that we are uh, inching closer to the very image of the Lord, Jesus Christ. It means that we are uh, growing in faith and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. It means that we are conforming to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the growth that I am talking about. If we are growing spiritually, then numbers will just follow. Because when people see that the Lord Jesus Christ is the one living in us and through us, then the, uh, the attraction will become natural and immediate, especially when the Holy Spirit does His convicting work in the hearts of many people. So they grew uh, exponentially. And in this church, we can find characteristics that should mark every New Testament church. So if we want to pattern our church, then I believe that this church is a very good uh, a model that we can follow. We can see several characteristics of what a New Testament church should be. Because today, our churches are, according to the uh, 
standard and the model of people leading the church. Ladies and gentlemen, some people who are standing behind the pulpit, some people who were given the authority think that they are the ones who should model or shape the church. Ladies and gentlemen, no. There is already a church. There is already a model. There is already a system set up by the Lord Jesus Christ. All we have to do is to follow the commands of the Lord. Amen. We have no right to build our own church, but we are here to follow the model that God had given unto us. So that when we look at this church, let us see if our church approximate the things that the church in Jerusalem did or were during this particular time. But note, notice, however, that there were temporary characteristics that are not patterns for the future in this church. Not everything should be followed. We should not pattern our church to everything that they have done. Remember, the book of Acts is a transitional book. They are going from the ministry of the Lord to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. From the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ preaching to the Jews to the ministry of going directly and particularly to the Gentiles. From the ministry to the Jewish people, they are going uh, to the ministry or ministering to all people without any prejudice, without any biases, where there is neither Jew nor Gentiles, but only one new man that is uh, the church that the Lord Jesus Christ built. So there are temporary characteristic example is apostles. There are no apostles today. Uh, when the Bible was completed, the, the, the ministry of the apostles or the office of the apostle ceased to be. So if, uh, in our church, we do not have any apostle. We have pastor because it's given to the church. We have evangelists, it's given to the church. We have teachers, it's given to the church. But there is no more apostles. So that's why if a person will claim that he's an apostle, the first question is, have you seen the Lord Jesus Christ personally? Because that is a requirement in order to become an apostle. So the apostle Paul became an apostle after the resurrection of Jesus Christ because Jesus appeared unto him on the road to Damascus. And he was personally called by the Lord. Not only that, but another thing is the apostolic signs and wonders. Remember that the Jews seek it for a sign. So when they are ministering to the Jews, signs are of a necessity. They need to perform miracles and wonders so that the Jews will believe that they really came from God. That is why uh, you will notice that every time the Lord Jesus Christ ministers, most often than not, he will first perform a miracle so that it will give authenticity that he is a man who came from God and that his authority is from heaven. So that is the reason why signs and wonders are needed. But now that we have a completed Bible and we are ministering to the whole uh, world, then signs and wonders uh, cease. And we do not have to perform them in order to convince people that we are of the Lord, but we have to use the complete revelation or the word of God. That is why we do not say that if you are sick, you come here and we will heal you so that you will know that we are from the Lord. And then the healing is unconditional. The healing is uh, unlimited. But I am wondering, I, I read a post that uh, there is one church who boasted of uh, their healing ministry. And they said that if you have high temperature, please do not come to the church. Go home and rest. Well, if you have a healing ministry, you will welcome all people inflicted with coronavirus because that is the time to show them that God is working in the church. Amen? So, but then again, we need to understand that this is just a temporary uh, characteristic that God has given to the church. And then, of course, communalism. Not communism, but communalism, wherein in Acts chapter 2 and chapter 4, they gave everything and placed them at the apostles' feet so that every man's need will be provided for. These are the things that are not being practiced in the church anymore. And even if they will not be found in the church, 
it doesn't matter because it is only through the transition period. But there are marks that are so important that we need to see that mark the first church and I believe it should also mark our church. Number one is salvation. Salvation. The fundamental mark of a New Testament church is a saved church membership. That is the goal. That is the plan of God. But you may say, but, but why is it, Pastor, that when the Lord Jesus Christ established his church, Judas was there. And we know that Judas was not saved. Well, if you're going to study it, you know that it's a prophecy. It is something that must happen. Because Judas will be used by God to be instrumental in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ so that the Lord Jesus Christ can perform his purpose of dying on the cross so that he can save mankind if they will repent and accept him as their Lord and Savior. But if you're going to look at this, you will see that those that were received in the church are those who gladly receive the word of God. Those who believe the gospel. Those who were born again. So we need to understand that the design of God for a church is to have what we call a saved church membership. A regenerate church membership requires the preaching of the gospel. Why? Because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Look at Romans chapter 1 verse number 16. Salvation. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Without the preaching of the gospel, there can be no salvation. Without the preaching of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, there can never be salvation. That is why the gospel is indispensable when it comes to salvation. Amen. May 14, 1986, I heard the gospel. By the grace of God, I got saved. And I know that you have that testimony that one day, you may not remember the, the, the year. You may not remember the month. You may not remember the day. You may not remember the date. But what you can remember is that one day, you heard the preaching of the gospel. You saw that you're a sinner. You saw that you're going to hell. And then you saw that there's only one way of escape. And that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Not by religion. Not by good works. Not by education. Not by money. Not by anything else. And you humble yourselves, repented, and accept Jesus. And that day, God has forgiven you. God has given you eternal life. You were justified. You were sanctified. And in the eyes of God, you are already glorified. So, a regenerate church membership requires the preaching of the gospel. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2 in verse number 4. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So why is it important to preach? So that people will have the knowledge of the truth. Nobody will be saved just thinking about they want to be saved. They must know the way. You see, it is very rare in our lives, at least, to arrive at a destination wherein you do not know the way. You must first know the way so that you can arrive at a destination. And that is the same thing about heaven. You must know the way. Because some people are banking on their works to reach that place. They're banking on the teaching of people to reach that place. But ladies and gentlemen, we have a GPS, and that GPS is the Lord Jesus Christ. That He is the way that we can reach heaven by the grace of God. And it is because we heard the knowledge of the truth, and that is the gospel of our salvation. So there must be preaching. That's why preachers are very important. Soul winners are very important for the salvation of mankind. It is a, a job given to us. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians that we are ambassadors of Christ. We represent the Lord Jesus Christ here on earth as Jesus Christ is representing us in heaven with the Father. Not only that, but look at Romans 6, 17. But 
God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. So there must be obedience to the gospel. Not only that it is the power of God, but in order for that power to be effective to us, then we must know it and we must obey the gospel. And obeying the gospel is by repenting of our sins and believing on the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Amen. And the Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, those who will believe and will confess Christ will be saved because they obeyed the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Next, a regenerate church membership requires conviction. It requires conviction. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Now, when they heard this, the presentation of the gospel, the history of Israel, of what Israel did to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. So, the pricking of the heart is the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. You see, sometimes we are being tempted to do the job of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes when we present the gospel, we pressure people to accept the Lord Jesus Christ, to receive Jesus Christ. We, we use hell in order to, uh, to install fear in their hearts so that uh, because of fear, they will accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Sometimes we use heaven in order to bribe them to, go to, to, to accept the Lord Jesus Christ because heaven is a good place. Ladies and gentlemen, there is nothing that we can do for the salvation of people but to present the gospel and let the Holy Spirit do the pricking in the heart of people. Yes, we can use heaven. Yes, we can use hell. But ladies and gentlemen, we are just the mouthpiece of God and the Holy Spirit will do the rest. Amen. You see, I, when I was pastoring in the Philippines, I used all of this tactic. Because I was a part of a, a, a group that believes in easy believism. That you just have to uh, present the gospel, the Romans Road, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then you follow after me, Lord, Lord. And then after they prayed the prayer, I will tell them, you are now saved. You will now go to heaven. The, the, the door of hell is now closed for you. No matter what happened, remember this day that you pray the prayer and then you will go to heaven. It doesn't matter if he lived the same way. It doesn't matter if he lives like the devil. It doesn't matter if he will even attend church or will even read the word of God. Ladies and gentlemen, salvation is by grace, but there is an evidence and the evidence is a changed life. Amen? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? New creature. Behold. What do you mean by behold? Something that you can see. Something that you can observe. Behold, all things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So there is a new man. There is an evidence. That is why it requires conviction. And said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do. Do you remember the Philippian jailer asking the same question to Paul? What shall I do to be saved? And you know what's the answer? Very simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thine house. No pressure. Amen? Do you remember the eunuch when Philip approached him uh, in the desert? And then Philip joined him in his chariot. And then Philip said, what are you reading? I'm reading about this man. Do you understand? I do not understand, except some would explain to me. And then Philip explained to him, and then he said, Here is water. What that hinder me to be baptized? And then Philip said, If thou believest, thou mayest. No pressure. No pressure. Let the Holy Spirit do his work. Our job is to proclaim. The Holy Spirit will convict. And when the Holy Spirit convicts, it will result in genuine salvation. Amen? True salvation will happen in the life of a person. There is no salvation apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. And salvation must not be done in order to force people with gimmicks and any other man-made uh, strategy. But it should be the sole work of the Holy Spirit. 
Next, a regenerate church membership requires repentance. Look at verse number 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You see, the answer is very simple. Repent and be baptized. This is one of the transition. Repentance. Repent and be baptized. And then the Bible says that your sins will be forgiven and you are going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, not only salvation, but also the gift so that you can serve God. Why? Because salvation is just the beginning of it all. It is the start of our race. It is the beginning of our spiritual journey in life. Once you got saved, you will now start to live your life for the Lord. Look at Luke chapter 13, verses 3 and 5. This was preached by the Lord Jesus Christ. I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So without repentance, there can be no salvation. That's why uh, th there is this teaching that is uh, uh, going around today that you do not need uh, repentance in order to be saved. Belief is enough. Faith is enough. But ladies and gentlemen, one thing that they do not understand is that Faith and repentance are inseparable. They go together. Because repentance is what? Turning from something to face something else. So if you turn from something, that is a change of mind. You change your mind about salvation. You change your mind about God because you are wrong. Now you know the truth. And then you will face the truth. And how can you face the truth? By putting your faith in what is right. So repentance, turning from what is wrong, change of mind, and then trusting what is right. So salvation and faith, when it comes to salvation, is inseparable. So there must be repentance in a regenerate church membership. Look at verse number 5. I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So it was repeated because of the importance. And then Paul also confirmed this in Acts chapter 17, verse number 30. Paul says, at the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. You see, it's a command. It's given to us that we should repent. Because without repentance, there will be no remission of sin. Look at Acts 20.21, 20, also according to the Apostle Paul. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, all kinds of people. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So you can see, repentance and faith, they go together. Amen. You cannot separate them. Because if you separate them, then there will be no effect. Okay, I believe in something that is wrong. And I turn my back on that something that is wrong. I changed my mind. I repented, but I do not believe anything else. What will it do to me? Nothing. Yes, I turn my back from what is wrong, but I did not accept anything that is right. I did not replace it up about what is right. Now, if you have faith without repentance, look at what will happen. I believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life, as well as Buddha, as well as all the gods that I believe in. Because I did not repent from what is wrong, I just received what is right and put them in one level as those things that are wrong. So there must be repentance, a change of mind, and there must be faith, believing on what is right. So a regenerate church membership requires repentance and, of course, faith. Repentance is to turn to God in submission. That you're submitting everything to God, that you're trusting and putting everything in the hands of God. What is repentance, Brother uh, Ponlu? That's our topic in Bible school. What's repentance? Amen. So repentance is a change of 
mind resulting in a change of action. And that is what everybody should do when it comes to our salvation. Repentance is not work salvation. It is a change of mind. It is not a change of life. Remember that. Repentance is a change of mind. That leads to a change of action or a change of life. But it is not a change of life. It is the fruit. Like what James is saying. Show me your, your faith without thy works. And I will show you my faith by my works. Therefore, works is the manifestation of faith. And, and the same thing as repentance. Good works or life that is right is the manifestation of real repentance from the Lord. So, but it produces what we call a life that is pleasing unto God. Next, a regenerate church membership requires glad faith. Acts 2.41 Not only that in verse 38, uh, Peter told them to repent, but in verse 41, the Bible says, And they that gladly receive his word. So that is faith. That is what we call glad faith as again i will emphasize it is not a manipulated or a pressured faith i hope and i pray that we are not going to use any manipulation to make people believe in the lord because any person manipulated to believe in god will not have real faith and will not have real repentance so we are defeating the purpose we are doing more harm than good when we do these things as i have told you i develop almost all the tricks when i was pastoring in the philippines just in order for people to make a manifestation that they want to receive the lord jesus christ as their savior and i will give them a false assurance that because they pray the prayer they are now a child of god so pastor is saying that nobody will be saved when they pray the sinner's prayer i'm not saying that it is very much possible that people will be saved because it depends on the condition of your heart when you pray that prayer. If you believe, you repent, and you believe, and you pray the prayer, of course you will be saved. But if you just follow the prayer for the sake of following the prayer, then there can be no genuine salvation that will result. Uh, I remember the story when Brother Tirso, one of our friends, a member of the church in the Philippines, he witnessed to an elderly man. And then he presented the Romans road and he said, he asked the man, do you want to uh, repent of your sin and accept Jesus as your savior? And then the, the, the elderly man said, okay, I will pray and follow me. And then, of course, he prayed, I'm a sinner, etc., etc. And then after that, he added this, and I promise, Lord, and then the elderly man said, and I promise, Lord, that I will attend on Sunday. Oh, no, 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 I cannot promise that because I have uh, a job on Sunday. You see, they are just doing it not only for the sake of following you so that you will stop and i can just do uh, go on with my life stop uh, disturbing me anymore there is no real understanding of the truth and there is no real convicting of the holy spirit happening in the heart of man that is why faith is a gift of god it's given to us without any pressure what did the bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of god it is only through the word of god not through any manipulative action a regenerate church membership requires conversion acts chapter 2 verse number 42 and they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers so you see the conversion before they're not interested in the word of god now they continued daily in the apostles doctrine with steadfastness they continued fellowshipping they continued breaking of bread and they continued in prayer so there is a conversion if you got saved you will never be the same there will be a change in your life you remember the song that we sing great change since i got saved the things I used to do, I do them no more. The place I used to go, I go there no more. The things I used to say, I say them 
no more. There's a great change since I got saved. So a regenerate church membership requires conversion. And supernatural salvation is the fundamental, listen, of all fundamentals for a sound New Testament church. Why? Listen to this very carefully. Even in the Old Testament, God does not want what we call mixed multitude. When the Israelites started to intermarry with other nations, it started the fall of Israel. Because the, the, the wives or the husband that they intermarry with will either lead them to paganism and the offspring will have a confused mind. So that's going to be the problem. That's why God does not want mixed multitude. Remember when we allow unsaved to become members of the church. The natural man cannot understand the word of God because they are spiritually discerned. So if half of the membership of the church are saved and if half are not saved, how can two walk together except they be agreed? We're going to have a problem. That's why many, many churches are having so many problems in their uh, church ministries because they are composed of mixed multitude. But pastor, can we be sure that we are all saved? Uh, no, we cannot. But we can minimize. Allowing people to come in if they really do not understand salvation and there is no proof in their lives that they were really converted by the grace of God. So one mark is salvation. Number two, baptism. Number two, baptism. Acts uh, chapter 2 verse 41. Were baptized, the Bible says, and there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So those who received were baptized. So listen, the believers uh, baptism is being taught here and baptism is only by immersion. Amen. Amen. It's not sprinkling. It is not pouring. It is immersion or uh, being submerged or being dipped under. Why? Because baptism depicts the gospel or the death, burial, and resurrection. I do not know if you have seen anybody being buried where they just poured earth on the... Uh, uh, the forehead of that person. That can't be. It should be total immersion because we are depicting the death, burial, and the resurrection. Look at Romans chapter 6, verses 4 to 6. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism. You see, buried into death. That like us, Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Verse number 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, you see a picture, likeness, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. So when we baptize, here is our baptistry, we dip them or submerge them under water. Because we are depicting the death. But then, thank God, Jesus Christ was resurrected. Amen? Because if not, the person will stay underwater. So when we raise that person up, we are picturing or depicting the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is what we call the believer's baptism. That is what we call the biblical baptism. And it was commanded by the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So when we teach people salvation, when they learn about salvation, when they receive salvation, then the next step is the step of obedience and that is to be baptized. Because salvation and baptism is the requirement for church membership. Amen. So if you're not... You're not saved, you're not baptized, you cannot be a part of the church. But technically, even people who are not saved can be baptized and will become 
a part of the church technically, but realistically, God knows the people that belongs to him. They may be in the church, but they are not recognized by God. Number three. Number one is what? Number two? Number three is discipleship. Discipleship. Verse number 42. Verse number 42. And they continued steadfastly. Listen, this is a strong emphasis on their obedience, zeal, faithfulness, commitment, and enthusiasm to the church and to the Lord. That's why a Christian, listen to me, should be joyfully serving God. You see, serving God is not something that we should endure. Yes, it is a, uh, a, a, a command given to us, but at the same time, like what John said a while ago, it is a privilege to serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen? Imagine being a part of the workforce of the Lord here on earth. That is why there is joy in serving God. You know what the Bible says? I believe in lamentation that the joy of the Lord is my strength. If there is no joy in serving God, then you will get burned out. Then you will, uh, you, you will become weary. And like Demas, you will turn your back and you will go back to the world. Wherein you think you can find joy and entertainment and all of these things. But ladies and gentlemen, to a real Christian, serving God is a joy. That must be manifested while serving the Lord. That's why you know, sometimes you will go to church and even the greatest painter in the world will not be able to paint your face. It is as if you're carrying the weight of the whole world. You see, you know what the Bible says? Casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. So we have somebody who is all powerful who said, My son, give it to me. I will take care of it. But we are going through life carrying so heavy a burden. When the Lord Jesus Christ says, My yoke is easy and my burden is light. We try to change the word of God. To our own liking. To our own experience. When all we have to do is to believe and to apply them in our lives. Amen? You see, in the Bible, the most common name for a New Testament believer is disciple. Listen, the term believer is used only two times. That's if you're taking note, you're not going to read it. In Acts chapter 5, 14 and 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. The word Christian appears only three times. Acts 11, 16. Acts 28, 26, 28. And First Peter chapter 4, verse 16. The word saint appears 62 times. I'm not going to give you all the verses. They appear 62 times. The word brethren appears 135 times in the Bible. But do you know, the word disciple appears 268 times in the Bible. So we can see that we are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And a disciple is defined by Jesus in John chapter 8 verse 31. And this is what we need to be if we are a disciple. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word. Continue habitual, consistent. Are ye my disciples indeed? Are the, are the members in, in the church in Jerusalem disciples? Yes, because the Bible says, and they continued steadfastly. So that is what a disciple is. So listen, don't tell me that you're a disciple when you attend church service and then next week you will not attend when you read the word of God today, but tomorrow you're not going to read the word of God. When you serve God today and tomorrow you're not going to serve God. Ladies and gentlemen, a real disciple is a person who will not only learn of his master, but will follow the very footsteps of his master. That is discipleship. That is being a disciple. So stop kidding yourself that you are a disciple of Jesus 
if we are not obedient on the things that the Lord Jesus Christ have said. You see, Christianity today is a Christianity of comfort. If it is not comfortable anymore, they will just stop and throw in the towel. Ladies and gentlemen, Christianity is even, though it is a privilege, it entails sacrifice. Because the Lord Jesus Christ says, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. That is Christianity. But, but this message is not being preached uh, behind the pulpit anymore. Why? Because it will antagonize people. Because it will make people uncomfortable. So, you, you mean to say, if I will serve the Lord, I'm not going to do this and do that anymore. I cannot live without doing those things. Ladies and gentlemen, if you got saved, you are not living for yourself anymore. We are living for Him who died for us. And that is something that we are forgetting. Because the Bible, sadly, is not being used behind the pulpit anymore, but we are watering down the Bible and substituting them with humanistic philosophies. Somebody posted the quotation of a certain Mother Teresa, and it says there that we should not allow color, race, or uh, other things, because we are all the children of God. Good to hear, right? Good to hear. And, and, and a, a Christian who is not discerning may even shout, Amen! Amen, Mother Teresa, you're right! It is not color. It is not a nationality. It is not our uh, uh, condition in life. Because all of us are the children of God. Amen! Wrong! John 8, 44. Ye are of your father the devil. How can all be the children of God when the devil is the father of some or even many? And the last of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. Now, you will only become a part of God's family, a child of God, if you do John 1.12. So by default, we are all the children of the devil. But as men as receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. You see? When you receive him, who? Jesus! That is the time that you will be given the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. That is why it is very important for us to really understand the word of God. So a disciple will continually learn about the Lord Jesus Christ. No Christian should be ignorant of the Bible. That is, I believe, the most shameful thing to happen to a person to be a Christian and yet not know the word of God. It's like you are a lawyer who does not know anything about the law. It's like you're a doctor who cannot even take the blood pressure of your patient. There must be knowledge because it is given to us by God. Amen? Number four. Number one. Number two. Number three. Number four. Apostles' doctrine. Verse number 42. They continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. You see, these Christians, they love doctrine. Amen. You see, when you say doctrine to, to a, uh, a Christian, they will say, oh, that's a boring subject. Well, we're going to study technical things. We don't like it. But these people, they love Bible study. No one had to order them to be present in Bible teaching meetings. If there is a chance that there is a Bible study, they will go there. If they hear that there is a, a, an activity here that will study the Word of God, they will go there. You do not have to order them. If the, the, church, uh, the door of the church is open because there is an activity in studying the Word of God, in probing all things so that we can hold past to that which is good, they will be there. Why? They love the Word of God. 
and as a child of God, we must love the word of God. David said, Oh, how love I thy law. There is that love in the heart of David. Why? Because the word of God is pure. The word of God is perfect. The word of God is a light that enlightens our path. The word of God is honey. It is a butler. It is a shield. The word of God is all we need so that we can negotiate this word and end up in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they love the word of God. They love studying. They want the word of God to be a part of their life. Why? Because loving the word of God is the evidence of true discipleship. Look at John 8:47. Actually, this is a proof that you're really safe. He that is of God, he read God's word. You see? If you are of God, you will hear the word of God. Ye therefore hear them not because ye are not of God. So you do not want to listen to the Bible. Why? Because you're not of God. And for the unbeliever, the things of God are foolishness. Foolishness. Oh, God parted the Red Sea. That's foolishness. It will never happen. You see, a scientist explained it away that during that time, there was an extreme low tide that they walk from one side to the other. It is not that God parted the Red Sea. That is why, I, 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 I don't know if you remember the illustration when there was this, this a child that's reading the Word of God and all of a sudden he shouted, Amen! Hallelujah! God is great! And then an atheist professor saw the, the, the lad and he approached and said, Why are you uh, ecstatic why are you happy and then he showed them the uh, he showed him the uh, account of God parting the Red Sea and then the professor said no that did not happen there was just a low tide and actually the water was only two feet at that time and then the Lord said is that so yes so you should learn from the experts and then the man walked away and after just a few seconds the child shouted louder than before and happier than before and then the man said why and he approached why are you happier and why are you more ecstatic than before because sir look at the account god was able to drown the whole army of egypt in under two feet of water and that is a greater miracle you see you will be ashamed when you go against the word of god amen so that is the reason why we need to love the word of God. Because if we are of God, we will hear the word of God. John 8, 31, 32. If you continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice. So they love the word of God. They love sound doctrine. They continued in the apostles' doctrine, not the doctrine of the heretics, not the doctrine of men man-made doctrines you see in our time if you will not prove all things then you are in danger of believing erroneous teaching propagated being propagated by big shot people in the ministry you see people when they accomplish something they think that they really accomplish it they're forgetting what the lord jesus christ says without me ye can do nothing they've forgotten what the apostle says i can do all things through christ which strengtheneth me they're forgetting that a professor of mine taught a different trinity when we were under him at the bible school he sound but because he was so successful he even had a television program and he he thought that he can create doctrine according to his caprice and whim because he said that you know i do not approve of christians not being faithful so i am going to create a teaching and will tell them that if you are not a faithful christian you will not be included in the rapture instead god will put you in a dark pavilion where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth and he said i am going to teach that so that my people will become faithful to the lord there is no resting and manipulating of the word of God. You teach what is right. You teach what is uh, being uh, taught by the Bible and let the Holy Spirit does his work in the heart and in the life of people. Because you see, if you will only follow God because of what I have done, then it is nothing before the Lord. It should be willfully done for God. And then he created another doctrine, Trinity. 
that is different from what the Bible is teaching and then just after a year he died why because the, word, the, the, the Lord may in his case not allow him to destroy a very important doctrine with heresy and maybe because you know God loves him so much that the Lord spared him from a life of just you know being uh, trodden down by people because of what we have done you see we must believe the word of God and that's it a church that continues in apostle doctrine has a testing mindset prove all things hold fast that which is good that's why we test everything I'm standing here I'm preaching I'm your pastor you receive the word of God that I'm preaching but once you get home you open the Bible and see if what I have taught you is really according to the word of God if it is not you talk to me pastor I believe you are wrong in this account you are wrong in this area we sit down we study and if I'm wrong I will tell you I'm sorry I'm wrong I'm going to change it I am going to pattern it according to the word of God so you help me I help you we're helping each other and we're glorifying God nobody's above the truth not even the pastor but today you will hear from behind the pulpit if you're a pastor then you are untouchable that that you will not commit any mistake because God is the one talking to you it is so sad to hear a pastor says that if I am not the one to teach you this you will never learn this so he's saying that is greater than the Holy Spirit ladies and gentlemen humility must be the trademark of a servant of God because there is nothing new under the sun everything that we know is only entrusted to us by God amen so when we test all things we are not having a critical attitude but we are just becoming objective and positive to avoid error and to hold fast that which is good so a church that continues in doctrine is a serious Bible study church so we need to be serious in the Word of God and then number five we're almost uh, done this will be the uh, penultimate point that I'm going to make fellowship verse number 42 and they continued steadfastly the Bible says in the Apostles doctrine and in fellowship amen you know Christians love fellowship but the fellowship that I am talking about here is not eating and playing and all of these things this is a spiritual fellowship it is a fellowship so that they will grow in the Lord you see the word does this eating and playing together but the fellowship that every true believer should have is a spiritual fellowship wherein when we gather together yes we eat yes we play but we talk about God we talk about the ministry we talk about mission we talk about the salvation of people maybe not all the time because it's not that you're playing basketball who are we going to support what country no of course you, you play basketball but then when we finish when we have our conversation we cannot help but talk about what is going on in the ministry and what is going on in our spiritual life and that is the fellowship that the the church in Jerusalem did and then lastly number six number one again number two number three number four what number five and number six prayers Acts chapter 2 42 the members of the first church loved prayers not only prayer but prayers plural it was a praying church prayer is mentioned at least 415 times in the Bible 129 times in the New Testament 35 times in the book of Acts 25 times in the epistle of the Apostle Paul so what does it mean it means it is a major emphasis of Christ teaching or the teaching of the Word of God so the true disciple is a praying Christian his life is a life of prayer remember we are commanded to pray without ceasing and in Luke chapter 18 1 the Bible says and the Lord spake a parable unto them unto this wise that men ought always to pray and not to faint 
Why? Because when we pray, we trust the Lord. When we pray, we are telling God, Lord, there is nothing that I can do. Help me. Without you, there is nothing that I can do. Prayer is depending upon God. You see, when you do things without praying, you think, you're saying that I can do this. Lord, let me take care of it. I can do it. But whenever we pray, we're telling, Lord, I cannot. Please help me. And our God will honor our prayers if that prayer is according to the will of God. Amen? We were asked to give a definition of prayer. And uh, they're going to have a prayer conference. And they said that give a definition of prayer. And if your definition will be chosen, then uh, there will be a free meal or something like this. I submitted mine. It uh, was not chosen. But, but this is how I define prayer. I said that prayer is the uh, common denominator of everything that we do for the Lord. When you sing, before you sing, you pray. Before you preach, you pray. Before you go out soul winning, you pray. Before you read the Bible, you pray. Everything that you do, you pray. Because if that is a, a common denominator of everything that we do for the Lord, it means that we depend on the Lord on everything that we do for Him. Of course, you will be biased. If I will be the one to choose, I will choose that. But then again, that is what I believe. That is my conviction. That when you pray, you are telling God, Lord, I cannot do it. But I am asking for your help. Help me so that I will be able to make it. So this is some of the characteristics of the New Testament church. In Acts chapter 2, 41 and 42, the church is not without sin. And the church is not without problems. So even a model church will have some problems and sin can creep in. But ladies and gentlemen, as long as we depend on the Lord, then the hands of God will be there. And He will help us go through all of these things so that in the end, when we finally face God, we will hear Him say, Welcome, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of our Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, as I and listen to me. In a time of pragmatism, let us hold on to the word of God. There may be things that will work. But if are, they are not found in the word of God, it's not for us to do it. Many churches are banking on entertainment to draw people into the church. But in our church, there should only be one attraction. And that attraction is the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if people will be attracted in anything else or anyone else other than the Lord Jesus Christ, they will not remain. They will not stay. No genuine change will happen in their lives. I remember one account in Dale Moody's life when he went back to a place where he preached the word of God. And then a skeptic approached him and said, Hey, Dale Moody, look at that man. He is now again entering that saloon. It was the man that you saved. When you were here the last time. And Dale Moody answered the man. Well that is to be expected. Because you said I saved the man. If the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who saved that man. He will never go back. To that place. Anymore. Church is not boring. If you are a real. Child. Of God. Amen. Yeah. Shall we stand up please. Every head's bowed.